This week, we begin with module four, which is focused on behaviorism. In this lecture, we're going to start with Ivan Pavlov and John B. Watson. Next week, we'll learn more about B.F. Skinner. We will start by learning more about behaviorism, what it is, why it developed, who contributed to it. Then we will learn about Ivan Pavlov and his conditioning studies. We will finish the lecture with John Watson, who is technically considered the founder of behaviorism. Let's begin with the simplest question. What is behaviorism? Just like functionalism, behaviorism had a big impact on the field of psychology. So much so that today we consider behaviorism to be the second force in psychology. Psychoanalysis is the first and humanistic psychology is the third. These three forces make up the broadest perspectives in psychology, particularly in counseling and clinical psychology. We use psychoanalysis, behaviorism, and humanistic psychology to treat mental illnesses and mental disorders. Behaviorism was an entire school of thought that focused on, you guessed it, behaviors. Behaviorists did not study consciousness like functionalists, like structuralists, like gestalt psychologists. The behaviorists focused solely on only those things that they could observe. Behaviors, actions, words that have been said. Behaviorists started out by studying animal behavior and trying to understand how animals learn, how they solve problems, in order to draw inferences about human behavior. This perspective began to emerge in the 1910s and became popular in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Behaviorism is a point in psychology's history where we can clearly see a transition from psychology being the study of the unobservable to the observable, from studying the unconscious and even the conscious to studying people's actions, behaviors, the words they say. Behaviorists used the scientific method to study behavior. Their observations had to be verifiable by others, which means introspection would no longer suffice. Your subjective description of your experience of some stimuli cannot be verified by other people. I cannot verify whether that is the actual emotion that you felt or the thought that you had. You can essentially tell me anything you want when I use the introspective method. Behaviorists also valued the practical applications of their theories. They truly believed that if we can understand the environment in which an organism lives, then we can control that environment and therefore have some control over the behavior. With behaviorists, it was all about predicting behavior and then controlling behavior. The image on your screen is just an illustration of the basic steps of the scientific method. Behaviorists would start out by asking some kind of question. For instance, how does music impact consumer behavior? Does a store that plays music sell more products? They would ask a question like this, do some background research to better understand the question they're asking. They would develop a prediction, some type of hypothesis. They would conduct tightly controlled animal experiments. They would then analyze the data and draw some type of conclusion about human behavior based on their animal studies. As you might have guessed, behaviorists were also concerned about the different environmental factors that shape behavior. Yes, behavior was important to them, but they also paid attention to the organism's surroundings, the environment. Some said we learn through experience. 
others said we learn as a result of rewards and punishments. Still others said we learn by forming associations between stimuli and responses to that stimuli. Behaviorists didn't always agree about the different factors that impacted behaviors, but they all focused on behaviors, on the observable, and they tried to pay attention to and collect information about the environment. They tried to control the environment in their animal studies. Even though behaviorism had an enormous impact on the field of psychology, its impact was limited to the United States of America. Behaviorism was really more of an American phenomenon. It was not as popular in Europe. In fact, Watson's original behaviorism did not immediately catch on. He published an article in 1913, and it took almost 15 years before the majority of American psychologists were familiar with and interested in studying from a behaviorist perspective. In the early 1900s, there were several other schools of thought that were also gaining popularity and competing for American psychologists' attention. Applied psychologists were using their principles to solve real world problems in the classroom and in businesses. Gestalt psychology had been brought here from Germany by its three founders and early cognitive psychologists were beginning to study memory, problem solving, learning. All of these things were happening in the early 1900s. By the 1930s, behaviorism was the dominant force among all of these different schools of thought. What are some of the reasons why behaviorism emerged when it did? And who are some of the individuals that contributed to its expansion? In the early 1900s, psychology and introspection were synonymous. Many people outside of the field assumed that all psychologists used introspection, and many of them did. This is one of the reasons why Ivan Pavlov detested psychology. He did not consider it to be a real science because it relied too heavily on methods like introspection. In addition, American psychologists like Cattell and Watson were becoming dissatisfied with the method. They weren't able to study some of the things that they wanted to study using introspection. If you're interested in studying animals and drawing conclusions about humans based on the results of your animal studies, how are you supposed to do that if you use introspection? You can't ask rats, primates, cats what they experienced. They wanted to get rid of introspection altogether. Behaviorism did this. Behaviorists did not use introspection ever. And because of this, because behaviorists and the typical American psychologist shared a distaste for introspection, it made American psychologists more amenable, more open to learning about behaviorism and all that it has to offer. There are two major weaknesses of introspection that make it a less than desirable method for studying human psychology. Number one, because it is a subjective method, the information cannot be verified. Only you know what you're thinking and feeling, and I can't say any different. I can't say that's not how you are feeling, but I also can't verify it. Behavior is more observable, and multiple people can observe a single behavior in order to verify it. The other problem with introspection was that it became so complex that participants had to be trained in order to partake in the study. That is not ideal. Today, if we had to train every single participant, our studies could potentially take double the time. Some of you may not know this, but the typical psychology experiment 
takes several years to plan, conduct, and then publish. In many cases, the participants were also the researchers. Behaviorism was very different. It required that the experimenter and the participant be two different roles. Participants could not be the experimenter and the experimenter could not participate in their own studies. Reason number two, Americans desire for practical, applicable products and services. We've talked about this in previous lectures. This zeitgeist, this climate of the times was very important to both the emergence and the success of behaviorism as a school of thought. Had it not been for this American value, this desire for things that are useful, things that are worth the money, things that make our lives easier, if it had not been for this idea, behaviorism may not have caught on when it did because that's exactly what behaviorism was focused on. They were focused on predicting and controlling behavior, both in animals and in humans. One of the reasons behaviorists pivoted from studying animal behavior to human behavior is because the American public sort of demanded it. When Americans found out that some of this research was being conducted on animals, there was this general sense that that wasn't going to cut it. So behaviorists started studying human behavior in order to understand human psychology. Who would have thought, right? Study the human in order to understand the human. Like the applied psychologists, behaviorists also used their principles to try to solve real world problems in educational settings, business settings, legal settings, and even in terms of addressing issues in the war. Americans' pragmatism in the early 1900s also played a role in the development of applied psychology. Same pressures were on both perspectives. This is a picture from New York City in the early 1900s. At about the time that applied psychology, gestalt psychology, and behaviorism, even functionalism for that matter, that all of these ideas were being tested and psychologists in the United States were becoming more familiar with these different ideas. I like to show images like this because I want to give you a feel for what those times were like. There were massive waves of immigration. There were all kinds of new things being invented, new products, new services. There were buildings being built, roads being built. There were manufacturing plants popping up all over the country. This progressive era was a time of progression. There were a lot of things being invented, created, developed. It's no wonder then that psychology kind of followed in those footsteps and began expanding and creating new ideas within itself. This is how we get behaviorism because all of these ideas are sort of competing with one another and behaviorism is essentially the one that wins during this time period. Now, applied psychology sticks around. It doesn't go away it eventually becomes a subfield. Behaviorism is a perspective that permeates all subfields of psychology. Behavior, behavior, behavior. Behaviorists focused on behavior. Who contributed to the development of behaviorism? John B. Watson is known as the founder of behaviorism. There were other people studying animal behavior and human behavior at the time. Absolutely. 1913, John B. Watson was not the first person to do this, but he was the loudest promoter. He talked about it everywhere he went. He talked about it in magazines. He talked about it on the radio. He talked about it with his colleagues. He traveled all over the country to different universities, given different speeches. He published books, articles, Articles not only in journals, but also in magazines that the typical American would read. He devoted his entire life 
to promoting behaviorism. This is one of the reasons why he gets credit as its founder. He was not the first, but he was certainly the strongest and loudest promoter of all of them. So behaviorism did not develop from the work of one individual, despite the fact that we give Watson this title of founder. At the bottom of the screen, you see a very simple timeline. It doesn't have any dates illustrating the progression of behaviorism. It actually began with Pavlov's classical conditioning studies, Thorndike's instrumental conditioning studies with cats and puzzle boxes also played an important role. Watson conducted numerous animal studies and helped promote the field. Then we have three individuals by the name of Guthrie, Tolman, and Hull. All three of these are considered pioneers in behaviorism. And finally, we have Skinner, who was responsible for studying operant conditioning. All of these individuals and many, 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 many more helped promote behaviorism in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. Here is a simple timeline of some of the most important studies in behaviorism. We have Ivan Pavlov's classical conditioning studies in the 1890s. We have Thorndike's puzzle box studies in 1898. In 1905, he published his Law of Effect, which we've learned about in a previous lecture. In 1920, Watson published the results of his Little Albert studies. In 1938, Skinner published some of his operant conditioning studies. In 1965, Bandera published his Bobo doll studies. And then several years later, he finished his social learning theory and published it in 1971. You can see that in 80 years, we went from studying drooling dogs to studying real people in real situations and emphasizing the environment, the social environment and how it impacts behavior. In this next section, we're going to learn about Ivan Pavlov. We'll learn about his studies and how he contributed to behaviorism. Ivan Pavlov is one of the best known individuals in the history of psychology, but he wasn't actually a psychologist. He was born in Russia and trained as a physiologist. Throughout his entire career, he considered himself to be a physiologist, not a psychologist. In fact, he didn't like psychology because at the time it was closely associated with introspection and introspection was not science, according to Pavlov. Many of us are familiar with Pavlov's classical conditioning studies and we'll cover these on the next few slides. His work was influenced by Darwin's 1859, Origin of the Species, and by Ivan Suchanoff's Reflexes of the Brain, which was published in 1863. Darwin's theory of natural selection highlighted the importance of the environment in inducing behavior. Suchanoff's work highlighted the connection between the environment and automatic responses, reflexes. Pavlov finished his medical degree at St. Petersburg University in 1883. He did not practice medicine. Instead, he worked as a researcher after graduation. He started working at the Institute of Experimental Medicine in St. Petersburg in 1891. His focus was on digestive systems. He was interested in how the process worked and how we might be able to solve different digestive issues that people were having at the time. While working at the Institute, he invented several new surgical procedures that he used to study the digestive system, but that could also be used to study other physiological processes. Because of the widespread use of these new procedures, 
Pavlov earned a Nobel Prize in 1904 for his work in digestion. Using the new procedures that he invented, he isolated different parts of dogs' digestive systems, their stomachs specifically, and collected gastric juices to study and to sell, that's right, sell to the public in order to fund his research. You can see in the figure here, he took a part of the larger stomach and sort of siphoned it off and separated it from the rest of the stomach. Now, what this did was it allowed him to collect uncontaminated juices from that part of the stomach. So by sectioning off part of the stomach, that, that part of the organ will still produce gastric juices when the animal eats. That is part of our physiology. When we eat, it sends a signal to our brain to send a signal to our stomach to start going through the digestive process. When the dogs ate food, their stomachs would begin this process and gastric juices would drip out of this miniature stomach. Now, why would anyone buy stomach acid from a dog? Because they were led to believe that it would balance out or cure their own digestive problems. He initiated this side business as a way to pay for the animals, their care, and the research that he was so passionate about. Weird, yes, but at the time, we didn't have grants and nonprofit organizations available to help acquire funds like we do today. Back then, you really had to find that money on your own. One of the reasons that Pavlov was so interested in digestion is because it's a reflex. It happens automatically. We eat food, the process begins. After his digestion studies, he became interested in another reflex, salivation. To study this reflex, he once again used dogs and he inserted these tubes up underneath their lips like this. You can see one of his stuffed dogs in the image there. There's a gland on the inside of the mouth that produces saliva. So he did the same thing with saliva that he did with the stomach acid. He collected it, he measured it. He didn't sell the saliva as far as I know, but he did collect it and take measurements. He wanted to know whether dogs salivate more when they eat dry food versus wet food. Go ahead and take a guess. What do you think? Does a dog create more saliva when it's eating wet food or when it's eating dry food? Dry food, that's what Pavlov discovered. Dry food has no moisture. And so the dog has to make up for that lack of moisture by creating more saliva. The body has a way of recognizing more saliva needed create more saliva. There's this feedback process that of course the brain is involved in. Pavlov was very interested in understanding how that reflex works. More saliva means the dog is able to break down that hard, dry food. With wet food, it's nearly broken down already. It's sort of just mush. So the dog does not need to create as much saliva in order to eat wet food. In the image on the right, you can see one of the preserved dogs. Later on in his career, he began removing the esophagus of his dog and replacing it with this contraption that allowed the food that a dog ate to just fall right back out of its throat into the bowl. And he did this because he didn't want to contaminate the juices. Students always want to know, did he ever feed these dogs? He did. When the dogs were participating in the experiments, he used these procedures. When the dogs were not participating 
They were kept in cages. They were on a large property. They did have handlers and they were taken on walks. They didn't live a miserable life, but you can make your own judgments based on the pictures. After the turn of the century, Pavlov and one of his graduate students, Wolfson, accidentally discovered that some of the dogs would salivate before they ate their food. This isn't normal. Lions, tigers, and bears, and dogs and cats, salivate when they eat, not minutes before they eat. Pavlov's dogs were drooling, their heads were moving, and their mouths were moving before he even set the food in front of them. He would walk away for a few minutes to do something, and when he would come back, the tubes that he had inserted into these dogs' mouths had some saliva in it. He noticed this and spent nearly the rest of his life studying how reflexes can be induced by different stimuli in the environment. Sometime between 1902 and 1904, he began to study this puzzle. His research program was focused on how animals develop and get rid of learned reflexes. So he presented different things in the dog's environment and over time, the dog began to associate that thing in the environment with the reflex, the response. His work would eventually help behaviorism emerge. One, because he used tightly controlled experiments to do his studies. And two, because his work was extremely popular at the time, and well-known by many people, not just in Europe, but also in the United States. His work also became a big hit with those who were interested in controlling human behavior. The Soviet Union donated quite a bit of money in the early 1900s to fund Pavlov's research. What they were interested in is how his principles could be used to control individual people to make them think a certain way, to make them act in a certain way. The Institute of Experimental Medicine was also supportive of Pavlov's research. In the 1910s, they built a special lab for Pavlov to conduct his research. It's called the Tower of Silence. This is a picture of Pavlov's laboratory. It gets its name because it was insulated to minimize the amount of sound coming from the building. As you can imagine, he had quite a few dogs living in this building. They barked, they made noises, some of them howled at night. And so the building was constructed so that other people on the campus would not be able to hear the dogs. It had several rooms. It had rooms for experimenting, it had rooms for the staff, it had rooms to take care of the animals. Let's take a look at Ivan Pavlov's original classical conditioning studies. We're going to break the process into three stages, before conditioning, during conditioning, and after conditioning. Here we have what happens before the conditioning process, before the animal actually participates in the experiment. We have the unconditioned response. In this case, it's drooling. This is the reflex. This is the behavior that happens automatically, the behavior that the animal does not have control over. What leads to this response? The unconditioned stimulus. Here, it's dog food. When the dog begins to eat the food, it automatically responds by drooling. This relationship between the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response, it's a natural connection. It exists in the wild, it exists at birth. We also have what he called a neutral stimulus. It's the thing in the environment that he picked to associate with the response. In some of his studies, he used a bell. I have a whistle here. 
the neutral stimulus does not lead to the response that we're focused on. In this case, we're looking for drool. A whistle, a bell is not going to lead to drooling before conditioning. So we call the whistle, we call the bell, the neutral stimulus. It has no association yet with the response. During conditioning, the two stimuli are paired together again and again and again. The neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus are paired together repeatedly. In Pavlov's original studies, he used a bell and presented it every time he fed the dogs. After conditioning, the neutral stimulus is called the conditioned stimulus because it will now elicit the conditioned response. Keep in mind too that the conditioned response and the unconditioned response are the same behavior, drooling in both situations. After conditioning, the bell, the whistle, will lead to drooling just as the food had done. This only happens when the two stimuli are repeatedly paired together. Even in the absence of the food, the bell will lead the dog to drool. In order to get rid of, extinguish this pairing between the whistle and the behavior, we simply stop presenting the neutral, the conditioned stimulus. Eventually, that association will go away. Pavlov studied dogs and their reflexes. Let's apply classical conditioning principles to two real life examples. Before conditioning, a virus causes vomiting. That is a natural pairing. Viruses in nature do cause nausea and vomiting. Before conditioning, soup does not cause vomiting. During conditioning, the soup and the virus are paired together. Many of us, when we get sick, we do in fact eat soup, maybe soup and crackers, maybe some of you have some other type of food that you would like to eat whenever you don't feel well. After conditioning, when the virus is no longer present, but we eat that particular type of soup, we might actually feel nauseous and we might vomit. The tendency for this kind of association to happen is one of the reasons why doctors who treat cancer patients sometimes order foods that people wouldn't normally eat outside of the hospital. So they might order banana ice cream for the patients. Banana ice cream isn't something that most of us can find in the grocery store. If cancer patients develop an aversion toward banana ice cream because it's been conditioned to elicit a nauseous, a vomiting reflex. If this is the case, it shouldn't impact the patient outside of their treatment. They will go back home and they'll be able to eat vanilla ice cream, chocolate ice cream, butter pecan ice cream, any other type of ice cream except banana flavored ice cream. Here is another real life example that many of you have probably experienced, but didn't realize what was going on and probably didn't realize that it was related to classical conditioning. In this example, before the conditioning occurs, a pleasant scent results in a pleasant mood, but the store that sells the scent does not elicit this positive mood. The scent does, but walking into the store has zero effect on the consumer. The conditioning process happens when you shop at the store. Some retailers will spray scents throughout the location in an effort to condition you to feel more positively toward that store. After conditioning, the store itself now elicits the positive reaction 
we don't need the perfume. We don't need the scent. The name alone or the store alone is associated with positivity. Retailers hope that by doing this, they can get you to come back to the store and spend more money. After more than 25 years of research, Pavlov published his classical conditioning principles in 1927. He focused on physiological responses, on reflexes. When we talk about B.F. Skinner next week, you'll notice that Skinner focused on learned behaviors, on voluntary behaviors. B.F. Skinner did not focus on reflexes. In his book, Pavlov encouraged researchers to focus on these reflexes. He did not see a need to focus on psychological processes. He also described the procedures that he used to develop and extinguish the reflexes. And he described how he controlled the environment, how he set up the experiments to minimize the impact of other stimuli in the environment. His classical conditioning studies were not his only contribution to behaviorism. Between 1891 and 1904, he supervised more than 100 graduate students. We learned earlier in the semester that Wilhelm Wundt supervised 186 dissertations. Both of these numbers are impressive. That means they supervised several graduate students each year. That is difficult even by today's standards. Pavlov's work took some time to make its way to the United States. It was written in Russian and it wasn't translated into English until the 1920s and 1930s when American psychologists were able to read firsthand about his studies they were much more interested in how they could do their own variations of his studies and how they could apply his principles to the already popular behaviorism. His work inspired many other psychologists, including John Watson, who we'll talk about next, B.F. Skinner, and also Walter Miles, who studied rat learning using mazes. Although the classical conditioning studies are well known, Pavlov's greatest contribution to behaviorism was likely his research program in general. His method of conducting research became the model for American psychologists. Each one of his studies investigated just a small piece of the bigger puzzle. He did not try to tackle the entire problem with one study. He broke the problem into components and then he designed studies to test these different components of the larger problem. The results of the study might spark new questions or if the results can't be replicated then he would go in a different direction. His methods were objective, precise, standardized, his lab was very organized and all of the researchers had to follow a very specific detailed protocol. He also prepped all of his animals for surgery. As you can imagine, a lot of graduate students wanted to work with Ivan Pavlov. He would pair his new research assistants with a more experienced RA in order for them to learn the ropes and understand the procedures that they needed to follow. They observed the more experienced researcher and then practiced by replicating previous studies. One of my friends sent me this joke years ago. Why was Ivan Pavlov's hair so soft? Because he conditioned it. On these last few slides, we're going to learn about John B. Watson, what he studied, and how he contributed to behaviorism. John Broadus Watson was an American psychologist who is known as the founder of behaviorism. Remember that although he wasn't the first behaviorist, 
he was the perspective's loudest promoter. He did the most for expanding behaviorism. Watson's childhood experiences were very different from those of the other psychologists we've learned about in this class. He was born in South Carolina in a poor family. His parents were very religious and wanted him to be a preacher. He later in life became an atheist. His father was an alcoholic and left the family when the kids were young. They moved to a different part of South Carolina and Watson really struggled in school. He got in fights. He did not make very good grades. And many of the people from his early life did not think he would be successful. He did eventually get into Furman University, but he continued to struggle even in college. But these challenges did not stop him. He earned his PhD in 1903 from the University of Chicago. He studied with the early functionalists, Dewey and Angel. At the time, functionalism was very popular at this particular university. Many of the functionalists were also studying comparative psychology. They were studying animal behavior. His dissertation focused on baby rats. He noticed that in the first few weeks of life, baby rats really don't learn a whole lot. They're focused on developing, not so much on learning how to run through a maze. After a few weeks though, the rats become more trainable. They become more responsive to the stimuli, the rewards, the consequences. In 1907, he and Harvey Carr taught rats how to run through different mazes. At the end of a maze was a piece of food. Over time, Watson and Carr noticed that the rats would make their maneuvers through the maze almost reflexively, automatically, like they weren't even thinking about it. They concluded that the rats were responding not to the external environment, not to external stimuli, but they were forming kinesthetic associations as they learned the maze. So the rats would remember how far they had to run before they turned left how far they had to run to turn right, and so on. The rats learned the body movements required to get to the end of the maze. They weren't responding to the environment. They were responding to this association that developed within them, this association between the brain and the body. If the maze was somehow changed, like one of the alleyways was shortened, the rats would run straight into the wall. They could clearly see there was a wall right in front of them, but they were so used to running straight in that alleyway and taking the turn later on down the hallway, they ran right into the wall and made a kerplunk sound. Sometimes these studies are called the Kerplunk studies because of the noise the rats made when they ran into the wall. He ended up at John Hopkins University in 1908 to take over the psychology department. Over the next few years, he worked with several different researchers. He actually worked with Robert Yerkes from Applied Psychology. They studied different animal species and their sensory capabilities. They mostly looked at visual perception. When he went to Florida for a few months, he studied the imprinting behavior of an animal species called terns. I have a picture here of a baby tern. It's a type of bird. There are several different species in Florida and he was interested in how these birds imprint on their parents. Some of you might be familiar with geese and ducks imprinting on their owners. He also studied what is called instinctual drift in these animals. This is when an animal's instincts 
take over any type of learned behavior, any type of conditioned behavior. For instance, with Pavlov's dogs, sometimes the dogs would revert back to their natural state, their natural way of doing things. Sometimes when he rang the bell, they did not salivate. It did not happen 100% of the time. That's because we're talking about complex animals. It doesn't happen 100% of the time. When an animal reverts back to their instinctual nature, we call this instinctual drift, drifting back to those innate animal instincts, as opposed to the response that we train the animal to exhibit. In 1913, Watson published the founding article of behaviorism. He called it psychology as a behaviorist views it. In this article, he criticized structuralism, functionalism, and especially introspection. He called for psychologists to use more objective methods, to use more scientific methods to study human psychology. He also said that there was no distinction between animals and humans, that it was perfectly acceptable to study animal behavior and then draw conclusions about human behavior. He said that although the behaviors look different, for instance, cats and dogs chase other animals up trees and humans don't do that, although the behaviors look different, the process of acquiring them and getting rid of them is the same. The goal for Watson and other behaviorists was to predict behavior, control behavior, by controlling the environment. By making changes to the environment, we could cause changes to the individual. In 1914, Watson was elected APA president. One of the reasons I like to share the APA presidencies is because it gives us an indication of when these people were popular. In 1914, Watson was well-known in the United States, so well-known that his colleagues chose him to be their representative. In the 1910s, Watson became interested in emotions. In 1917, he and J.J.B. Morgan published the results of one of their emotional development studies. They looked at infants, and observed how they respond to different stimuli and how their emotional responses to these stimuli are conditioned. They identified three types of human emotional responses to stimuli, fear, rage, and love. When the babies were afraid, they cried a lot and blinked their eyes. They usually did this when Watson presented some type of loud noise or when the infants were left alone. They weren't really left alone, but the babies thought they were alone. Rage included things like hitting, kicking, stiffening of the body. You know, kids do that sometimes. They usually responded this way when Watson wrapped them up or held down their arms and their legs. Love included smiling and cooing and eye contact, looking the other individual in the eyes. Babies usually responded in this way when they were talked to, when the tone was nice and calm, when they were gently you know, touched on the cheek, patted, rocked by another person. They documented the different situations, the different stimuli that resulted in these responses. Several years later, in 1920, he and one of his graduate students, Rosalie Rayner, published the results of their Little Albert study. They were focused on how fear is conditioned, how it is acquired, 
how it spreads from one stimulus to another, and how persistent it is. They concluded that emotional responses like fear are conditioned, are learned over time, often in childhood, sometimes in adulthood. I'm going to describe the study on the next few slides. Keep in mind that after they conditioned Albert to be afraid of different stimuli, they did not attempt to uncondition him. They didn't attempt to extinguish the fear. They left it as it was. Later that year, after they published their results, Watson ended up resigning from John Hopkins University. His wife had found out about his affair with Raynor and demanded that the university fire him. The university instead asked for his resignation and Watson agreed. This is relevant because it contributes to the spread of behaviorism. This is relevant because the event contributed to the spread of behaviorism. I'm sure Watson's wife did not realize that her actions would indirectly impact the field of psychology, but it did. Watson eventually moves from academia, from John Hopkins University, into the business world, into marketing, and he takes his conditioning principles, his conditioning ideas with him and has a big impact on the marketing field. Watson and Rosalie worked with a nine-month-old infant named Albert, and you can see him pictured here. Rosalie is the woman who is sitting directly behind Albert in this photo on the left. At first, Albert was only afraid of a loud noise. Nothing else bothered him. He wasn't afraid of the white rat. He wasn't afraid of the white furry coat. He was only afraid of the loud noise. Who wouldn't be? What child wouldn't be? After the rat and the noise were paired together over and over again, Albert began to fear the rat. He began to cry, as you can see in the image on the right, he began to cry every single time they put the rat next to him. The loud noise was not needed, was not required to induce this fear. One of the things that was surprising was that fear could be generalized to other similar stimuli that were never paired with the loud noise. After pairing the rat and the bunny together, Albert became afraid of even the bunny, as you can see here in the GIF. He eventually became afraid of Watson himself. Watson had white hair with glasses and Albert associated Watson with the loud noise and probably with the white rat. There was a white fur coat. Um, there were other furry objects that they uh, placed with Albert and the rat. The loud noise was not needed to make Albert afraid of these other stimuli. Just being presented with the rat was enough for him to also begin to fear these other things that, remember, he did not fear in the beginning. Throughout the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, Watson promoted behaviorism using a variety of channels. He talked about it in speeches, in books, articles, magazines, radio broadcasts. He talked about behaviorism and his work everywhere he went. He was successful in part because American psychologists were ready for a more objective scientific approach, something that didn't rely on introspection, something that was more practical. Plus, the American public had started to recognize how one's environment, how one's childhood can impact adulthood, can impact how they think and act later on in life. One of the other ways that Watson was able to spread the word about behaviorism 
was because he went from being a professor and researcher in academia to becoming an advertising executive. But this was really just one of the ways that Watson was able to bridge the gap between basic research in the lab and applied research in psychology. He studied behavior in the lab, but then he used the principles, the conclusions that he drew to try to address real world problems in a variety of different situations, much like the applied psychologists tried to do. The year after Watson resigned from John Hopkins University, he became an advertising executive at J. Walter Thompson and used his understanding of human behavior to help market some of their clients' products. I have a few examples of the things that he helped promote. These are not his deliverables, they're not his designs, but these are the brands and the products. Maxwell Coffee, Pond's Lotion, and Pebico Toothpaste. One of his ads for the toothpaste presented a woman seductively smoking a cigarette. And his message was essentially that uh, this toothpaste can help even women who smoke have beautiful white teeth. For the rest of his life, he worked in the advertising business and made several times more than he would have had he remained a professor. During his remaining years, he continued to promote behaviorism, write books, articles, give speeches, mentor other individuals, and apply psychology to the marketing of products. Now that you know more about what behaviorism is, how it got started, and two of its earliest contributors, I hope you are starting to see the connection between early psychology and modern psychology. Behaviorism is that bridge between the two. It is an important part of psychology. I hope that you enjoyed learning about Pavlov and Watson. Next week in week 11, we're going to focus on B.F. Skinner and his operant conditioning principles.